Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar series. Uh, today's webinar, which is our sixth in this series, is titled The Caste in the Diaspora and the Growing Global Movement for Caste Abolition. And it is a conversation with Tenemori Sondara Rajan from the Equality, Equality Labs in, on, in the US. Uh, before I begin, I want to uh, do some housekeeping. Give me a second. Uh, yeah. Um, so before I begin, I want to make an acknowledgement to country. I acknowledge uh, the land, waterways, and airways of the many First Nation people we, which we work on, uh, which we work, study, live, and gather for this event, including the traditional custodians of the Dharawal, Kulin, Lisian, Olon, Muvekma, and Chochonya nations. We would like to pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. We would like to pay our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may have joined us today. Uh, a little about the series. The series invites activists, scholars, um, and academics from across the Indian diaspora to dialogue on the challenges and possibilities of contemporary activism for human rights, democracy, social justice, and peace in the diaspora, especially in the diaspora. Speakers in this webinar series share a wealth of activist knowledge and strategies, including street and online protests, political advocacy, awareness raising, and popular education, activist media, and transnational coalition building. Our goal is to learn from the present as well as past mobilizations against forces of colonialism, imperialism, ethno-religious nationalism with a focus on Hindu nationalism and or Hindutva in the Indian diaspora. So oh, there's been a lot of talk around that recently. <laughs> we have had uh, five webinars uh, up till now. I think, I don't think the fifth one is up yet on our YouTube channel, but the first four are, uh, including one from last year with Anand Patwatan, which was the most recent upload. Uh, uh, you can see the webinars on our YouTube channel, which I'll also bring up how, what the channel looks like a little later. Um, and yeah, uh, just a little background into why we are uh, organizing this or why we organize to do this. It is ultimately to recognize the fact that the awareness around the caste system is not enough. And there needs to be an active form of organization that works towards dismantling, not just the caste system, but the dispossession of oppressed caste people and indigenous people back in India and in Australia and across all First Nations, wherever Indian diaspora resides. So yeah, ultimately it has to mean that Indians don't just, uh, oppressor caste Indians don't just stop colonizing their people that they live with in India, but they also stop being complicit as settler colonists wherever they go, as transnationally mobile privileged diaspora. Uh, a tribute to Dr. Gail Omwet, who recently passed away. Uh, just to acknowledge her contribution to the anti-caste movement and bringing Dr. Ambedkar's work back to light when, yeah, a lot of forces were working against letting that happen. Uh, we thank Gail for her contribution to the movement and in bring, uh, you can uh, look her work up uh, on Google Scholar or yeah, do buy her books, do read her. She's amazing. Uh, uh, we have had two previous webinars on uh, the idea of fighting casteism. Uh, there is one where I spoke as well. <laughs> Actually, both Nisha and I, who's my co-host, we spoke there as well. We had some amazing anti-caste scholars on that panel, uh, 
I think it's webinar three on our YouTube channel. And the last one that we had was with three really amazing anti-caste activists from the UK, uh, Ravi, Santosh, and Lake. That webinar is also now up. It is titled, it is numbered webinar five, I think, on our YouTube channel. This is what the channel looks like. So uh, I, I don't think the fifth one is up yet, but yeah, it will soon be. Uh, and yeah, so now to introduce our speaker today, uh, I, I don't think I really need to say much because she is quite, uh, yeah, she's quite active in this space. So uh, Tanimori Sondara Rajan uh, is the co-founder and executive director of Equality Labs. She's a Dalit rights activist, a technologist, and a theorist. She is the co-founder uh, of the Equality Labs, which is a transmedia artist and activist uh, platform. She believes that the story, it, uh, the story that she tells, is most important as a unit of social change. Uh, Equality Labs is a Dalit civil rights organization that uses community research, cultural and political organizing, popular education, and digital security to build power to end the caste apartheid. Also, white supremacy, gender-based violence, and religious intolerance. Uh, just a little housekeeping uh, in, in terms of what the webinar is going to look like. It is not a Zoom meeting, so you won't be, you won't have access to your camera or yeah, you won't be able to just unmute yourself and speak at any time. Uh, it is also not being live um, broadcasted anywhere. Uh, so yeah, if you do want to ask a question, we'll have to indicate that and we'll allow you access to camera and um, sound. Uh, if you can also keep your question anonymous and just tell us that. So then we'll um, just ask your question on your behalf. The webinar is being recorded though. So yeah, if you do come on and ask a question, but later realize you don't want to be on camera, you can always say that and we will edit you out. It is about a 90 minute event where um, the speaker and panelists will speak for about 60 minutes and then there'll be a 30 minute Q&A. Yeah, you can put your questions in the Q&A uh, forum. And thank you so much for your participation and thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, Jai Bhim, Jai Savitri. Uh, I'll now invite Nisha to uh, introduce herself and then we'll move on to starting the panel. Nisha. Thanks, Mudit. Can I ask you to introduce yourself first? You haven't said anything about who you are. Please, you go first. Thanks, Nisha. I am uh, a graduate researcher at Monash University in Melbourne. I research the political economy of arts and yeah that's pretty much it i my thesis is on the idea of why social justice is not enough in anymore especially in an anti-caste context in india uh, and especially in the diaspora and we maybe need to start talking about how the dispossession of oppressed caste people and um and indigenous people of India and Australia probably overlaps and needs a decolonizing framework. It sent, obviously it foregrounds the oppressor and not the oppressed because I feel that has been the main um, modus operandi for upper caste, oppressor caste scholars to, yeah, to divest themselves off of their complicity in the caste system. So yeah. That's about it. Thanks, Nisha. Over to you. Thanks, Mudit. Good morning and good evening, everyone, wherever you're joining us from around the world. My name is Nisha Taplial. I'm an academic at the University of Newcastle, um, and I do research on social movements and activism for social change um, with, with a particular interest in issues of inequality and discrimination and colonization and decolonization. So this webinar series has come about uh, as part of a larger project that I've been working on uh, around resistance to Hindu nationalism in the global Indian diaspora. And uh, I've been very privileged and honored to meet activists like Denmori because through this research, 
who have kindly agreed to also do this webinar for us. So I have been looking forward to this particular conversation for more than a year now. Um, and I'm very excited to, to have Tenmori with us today, as I'm sure are all of you. So I won't take up any more time and over to you, Tenmori. Thank you for joining us today. Yes, Jay Beam and Jay Savitri, it is such a pleasure uh, to be here and to be able to uh, have this really urgent conversation about a system that some of us know a lot about, but surprisingly, we, you know, there's a real gap between our knowledge and our practice. And I think that's really where I think when we start to hear the stories of caste oppressed movements um, with the idea of us having self-reflection and agency around it, I think so much can change. So again, really grateful for both, you know, Professor Nisha and for Mudbeep for creating this space and really want to thank everyone here for joining us as we get into this conversation. So again, part of what I'm hoping to discuss today is really getting in deep about the understanding of how caste exists within the diaspora um, and the journey towards caste equity um, within the civil, you know, civil rights movements that are popping up around the world. And, um, and the thing I find so interesting, because again, I am a caste oppressed person, a Dalit person that was born outside of our homelands. And I think that's really important to think about, you know, how does someone become a Dalit outside of South Asia, right? When you think about what caste is, caste is this system of oppression that, you know, exists primarily because of land relations and scriptural practices and is very much linked to South Asian context. So why is it that we are seeing it pop up in Australia, the United States, and the UK? And you know, as someone who experienced untouchability in the diaspora, the thing that I found so interesting is, is that we are mindlessly recreating the wound of caste without an acknowledgement of what's actually happening within our bodies and, um, and our, our histories that we have now somatized into continuing violence um, outside of the region. So what I hope to do today is to talk a little bit um, about creating a shared definition of caste and how it occurred within um, North America, but also the movements that have arisen um, specifically uh, to address this problem um, with the idea that we can have a shared conversation related to caste equity within all of us who are part of the global diaspora. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, and since I won't be able to see the chat, if um, you guys could be monitoring the questions, then we will go ahead and begin. So let's go ahead and present. Um, so I find what's very useful um, in talking about caste is I think we need to have shared definitions because one of the things that we see in increasing polarization of the diaspora, we are losing consensus on facts. You know, and, and I think caste is definitely one of those fault lines where we do not have agreement within the diaspora as to what it is, despite evidence-based record to what the system of exclusion is. So I just wanna be very clear. When we're talking about caste, we're talking about a system of exclusion that affects more than 260 million people worldwide. This exclusionary system ranks people at birth with one's caste determining the whole of their life, from their jobs, where they can live, whom they marry, and even whom they worship. And what I think is important to think about is that the social category of caste, which is you know, very important within civil rights movements around the world, um, you know, is a discrimination that is based on dissent and work. And in that regard, many people in the diaspora um, have really made links with other um, systems of caste exclusion that exist also in South America, Japan, and parts of Africa. And the reason why that's so crucial is that it is part of the justification for understanding why caste should be its own protected category, because it, it you know while it sits between you know categories like discrimination based on ancestry or um, faith or 
class or race, it's actually none of these things. It is its own protected category. And the fact that we see such analogous systems of caste in so many regions is a justification for us delving deeper within our own context because it originated in South Asia. And for folks that aren't familiar with the South Asian American context, you know, for us, you know, we often have to explain over and over again what is a South Asian. And, you know, to be clear, we're talking about, um, you know, Americans who are from any of the South Asian countries, as well as indentured communities like the Indo-Caribbean and Indo-Fijian communities. And this is why it's so crucial when we talk about caste discrimination that we don't say caste and Indian Americans or Indian um, uh, immigrants, because it goes across the entire region. And oftentimes, caste depressed voices from these other um, contexts are very siloed and silenced even within these conversations. And caste protected, you know, caste oppressed peoples are really minorities within minorities. And that's really the language that you often have to use with advocates and stakeholders um, who are in uh, power in the diaspora because they're like, well, aren't you all brown people? And we have to say, no, we're not all brown people. Um, you know, and, and it's a significant issue because this intersectional lens of caste is so critical because we're 1.7 billion people in the world. One in six people in the world are Indian. One in four are South Asian. So an intersectional issue like caste really is a global issue. And in the United States, there's 5.4 million South Asian Americans, and we're one of the largest groups of immigrants that are growing today. Now, I think one of the challenges that I really want to kind of like help, you know, ground this conversation that we're having in, especially as Australians begin this conversation towards caste equity, is that the category of South Asian is really a fraught category. You know, we are racialized under white supremacy to be seen as all South Asians, but in fact, this racial category flattens very real unhealed historical trauma that we have with each other that's related to caste and genocide and partition. And these divides, whether they're of language or nation or caste, um, are so profound and we do not ever speak about it because the journey once we get to wherever we're going, once we've left um, you know, our homeland and crossed the Kalapani into um, our new home, the, the reality is, is that uh, the lack of discussion and discourse of this unhealed trauma is one of the reasons why we mindlessly create and continue um, traumatic experiences of caste. And so we have to begin to really understand our history, really, you know, digest it and really begin to unlearn the supremacy that is embedded within these histories and lineages in order for us to move forward um, with consciousness and towards freedom. And for me, I think, you know, one of the challenges I saw in this work was that, you know, as someone who was Dalit, you know, and again, I grew up in the United States, was born in East LA, and I saw lots of different forms of caste discrimination. I had, you know, plates removed from, you know, where I was eating because people thought um, I would be polluting their, their, their plates and their silverware. I also saw um, slurs being thrown around um, against caste oppressed people, including myself, and I saw people facing exclusion in terms of workplaces and university. However, you know, when Dalits explain these issues to stakeholders in power, we're not legible to them. You know, so part of the legibility and the validation of our lived experiences of oppression meant that we had to also not just tell our stories in terms of um, testimony, but we also had to be able to tell our stories through data. And that was one of the key kind of contributions that Equality Labs really offered within the battle for caste equity was we created one of the first surveys to document um, caste discrimination in the diaspora. We conducted this in 2016, and to, to show how much people thought this was a non-issue, we could not get people to support this issue. We asked several professors and other community institutions, and they thought it was a non-issue. And so the way that we ended up doing this survey was I put it on my credit card 
And all of the cast oppressed people that worked on this did this as a labor of love because we knew that these stories were significant. We knew that the harm that we were um, living through was difficult and that it needed a remedy. And so we committed our time to, um, to do this. And what we found was astonishing. You know, one in four Dalits uh, who had responded to our um, survey said that they faced some form of physical assault based on their caste. One in three said that they reported being discriminated against in their educational um, backgrounds. And two out of three said that they experienced being treated unfairly at their workplace. And given the rest of the data, it was not surprising that as a result, over half of the Dalits that took the survey said that they lived in fear of being outed for their identity and were passing. And that was shocking because now we finally had a data set that proved what was going on for our community, which is why it was so crucial for us to begin building power on this issue. And one thing that I think is really important is that when you are talking with you know, governmental stakeholders or corporations or university institutions, they really don't understand how caste works at all. You know, so for them, they're like, well, you know, does it mean that it's always, you know, when we're thinking about this pyramid of caste and these major categories of classes that emerge, you know, there's literacy both in knowing what each of the castes do. So the folks at the top being the priests who wrote the scriptures that define this system, but then you have Kshatriyas who are the rulers, Vaishyas who are the merchants, Shudras who are their peasants. And then outside of this whole system, there being Dalits and Adivasis, you know, indigenous people who were the Adivasis, and the group of outcasts that were formerly known as untouchable, but who have rejected that term because of how vile that term is, who now call themselves Dalits or Embedkarites or Buddhists, whatever they can, anything except that label of untouchable, right? But I think what's also really crucial in advocacy is that outside of this history lesson, it's very important for people to understand how caste operates as a structure of exclusion. And I think what's significant here to explain is that every, you know, as Dr. Ambedkar spoke about, caste is a system of graded, you know, um, inequality where the lower you go on the pyramid, you increase in numbers, but you actually lose access to key structures within society. And so the people at the top, you know, they have greater access to opportunities, resources, and ownership, um, and they are able to wield that access against those at the bottom. And those are the dynamics that we're seeing in American institutions. In any American institution that has significant South Asians present, we are starting to see these dynamics replay over there. And I think one of the challenges that we're really seeing at this time is that there is a huge data gap related to caste. Because um, when we don't have caste as a protected category, you know, the, the people who are responsible for creating cultures of belonging, um, you know, are not tracking both the incidences of harm and also um, ways that there could be growth towards caste equity. And that's why you know, it's such an important call that the civil rights movement is making right now. Because once we add caste um, you know, to the list of protected classes and non-discrimination clauses, all the things that happen afterwards are what are going to help us achieve our goals for annihilation of caste. This includes being able to do trainings around caste competencies, setting key metrics related to caste equity in terms of, you know, you know, in, in a university setting that could include, you know, increasing student enrollments from caste oppressed backgrounds, hires of caste oppressed faculty members, you know, diversity in terms of teaching and pedagogy. We have no way to be able to address these equity challenges without data. So it all comes back to, in order to collect data, we need to acknowledge it's a problem, which is where the addition of caste as a protected category is so crucial. And the reason why this is so urgent is because wherever South Asians go, they bring caste with them. You know, caste is a global problem now. We are hearing of significant caste discrimination everywhere, from Australia to New Zealand to the, the Caribbean colonies to Africa to um, uh, Europe and to North America. 
So unfortunately, there is no land base that is not, you know, touched by caste, you know, pun intended. So I think that, you know, at this moment, because we're seeing it show up in all of these different places and institutions from universities to service organizations, we've got to be able to address this. And we have the tools to do this because we've been doing this with other protected categories. And that's why we need to move in this moment right now. Now, you know, for people who don't know some of the history of caste in the United States, I just wanted to run down um, some of the examples. And, you know, what's very interesting is one of the first known records of a South Asian in American history is from these records um, in East Salem, which were the shipping records, you know, that came from, you know, the East India fleets that would drop by, right? And so there was, you know, a reverend there who was on the ship, and he had this diary entry where he talks about meeting a native from Madras, right? And so in his description, he says he is of dark complexion, long black hair, soft countenance. And a crucial detail that that person shared with the reverend was that he was darker than Indians in general of his own caste. <laughs> And when I read that, I was so shocked because I was like, again, even through a colonial narrative, it was so significant of a detail that was written that this Indian, you know, person on the ship shared, I might be dark, but I'm definitely not cast oppressed, you know. And that just tells you how much anxiety uh, and really how much of a social uh, marker caste is, is that even when we're leaving our land base, you are seeing people talk about their identity in relationship to caste. And I think what's also important, I think this is also a similar history in Australia, is that you know a lot of this, the, the first um, immigrants that left um, the subcontinent were caste oppressed, you know, and many of whom were coolie workers that went on to form the indentured communities across the British colonies. But what was so significant is that these were caste oppressed workers because at that time there was this big prohibition for dominant caste people not to travel outside of the land base because to travel the Kalapani or the Black Waters would have people lose their caste identifications. So many of the workers that travel through these indentured pipelines are in fact caste depressed. And you know, there was even, you know, because the ways caste, you know, different castes collaborated with the English was very complex. So we saw that, you know, dominant castes like Brahmins, you know, worked a lot with the administration of the British. And at a time when they were trying to bring, you know, British uh, uh, and bring Brahmins, you know, Brahmin collaborators onto um, boats uh, to go to different colonies, they would actually carry um, a big cauldron of water from the local land base to try to, you know, get around this Kalapani issue. So it's, it's a very deep part of um, our immigrant networks. And, um, and I think that, you know, as a result in the United States, some of the first immigrants that came to um, the United States were actually Punjabi um, immigrants. And at that time, you have to keep in mind, India didn't exist. Um, so they identified as Sikh or Punjabi. Um, and within the American landscape, they viewed everyone coming from the region as Hindus, H-I-N-D-O-O-O. -O -O. But in reality, they were Punjabi, most of whom were caste oppressed. And what was also very critical was that those first laws didn't allow women to travel. So it was solely men. And they were working in industries like helping build the American railroads, as well as working the timber mills um, in the Northwest. And I think that this is, you know, uh, an image that we have of some of those early um, timber workers in the Northwest. And, you know, what is significant is, you know, these immigrants were coming at the, you know, at the early 1800s. And even in those first workers, we saw caste kind of rise up. So we have from the accounts of the family of Anita Lal, who is a third generation, um, you know, Dalit immigrant in British Columbia, that her, you know, her ancestor, when they came, they worked for this lumber mill. And um, when they got there, you know, most of the folks there were Punjabi and her family was Chamar. And so her, you know, great, great grandfather was forced to sit on the floor. And the owner of the mill came in and was like, what is going on here? Like, why are there some people eating on the floor <laughs> and everyone else is eating at a table? And they said, well, it's because he's a Chamar, you know, and 
uh, which is an untouchable cast. And so um, he was like, well, we're not doing that here. And he forced the integration of both the, the dining area and the bunks as a result. But to me, I think what is you know so profound is that even in the first instance of workers' conversations, we are seeing cast as early as that. And I think there's a lot of areas within Australian history to look at is are there testimonies from those early workers about segregation around those areas that can lead to an understanding um, around this question of caste? And, you know, I think that this period was so fraught, right? Because, you know, in addition to dealing with the pressures of, you know, immigration, there was deep xenophobia, you know? And so at this period, um, you saw intense rebellions against having brown workers. And, you know, they, you know, there was just a lot of like offensive language, like the dusky peril, you know, images of people in turbans. And, you know, even though they're Punjabi, they're being like, you know, misreligified as Hindu hordes. And it was just a very, you know, traumatic um, period. And I think that as a result of this, you know, despite the xenophobia of this moment, we saw um, South Asians try to fight this um, racist segregation. And a big part of it was, and I'm gonna go to this and then I'll come back to that image, is that you know because of the rise of so much immigrant labor, you had um, xenophobic movements to basically restrict who could be considered an American citizen. And so one of these laws was called the Asiatic Bar Zone, and any immigrant that came from here um, had to go through rigorous testing and um, uh, uh, to be able to first immigrate, but also that people from these areas could not be citizens. And that's where we saw this racial uh, this racialization of citizenship where unless you were white, you could not be a citizen. So what happened in response to that? Well, our first challenges from South Asians who were dealing with this basically made the argument um, that they were actually brown white people because they were upper caste. So on the left, you have A.K. Mozumdar who was in Washington. And you know, on the right, we have Bhagat Singh Thind. And you know, their, their testimonies you know, in terms of immigration law are some of the first written legal conversations about caste um, in terms of um, uh, citizenship. And you know, I think the thing that I was so struck by was how deeply anti-Dalit and anti-Black their arguments were. In fact, with Bhagat Sin Thind, you know, what he said was is that you know, he would support anti-miscegenation laws because he would never, ever, as an upper caste person, you know, sleep with someone who was, you know, um, he said, he's the, he's the term, he was talking about um, an Amabasi, um, but it was just profound, you know, how easy um, it was for them to claim whiteness at the expense of, you know, black communities. And this goes to what Mudith was talking about, is that our approach of being settler colonials is so informed by how easily we fit into systems of hierarchy where we can diminish those below us in order to um, uh, you know, go upward within those pyramids. And, and I think this is a deeply true thing for caste where you know, South Asians as a whole pursue white agency you know, quite ruthlessly um, at the expense of other BIPOC communities. And this is related to our training and our trauma related to caste supremacy, which is why we need to do better in terms of being self-aware um, of our processes um, around that. Um, I would also say that, you know, there was this very, you know, powerful movement for independence called the Gadar Movement. And the Gadar Movement, which mobilized, um, you know, arms and resources for the independence movement, erased its own legacy of Dalit participation. But that was kept alive actually by, um, you know, Ravadasya communities on the West Coast who talked a lot about Mughal Ram Mughalia, who uh, was, you know, one of the strong founders of the Gadar movement, um, was himself, um, uh, you know, Chamar, and, um, and he was passionate about this. And when, you know, very famously, the Gadar movement brought a shipment of arms to the subcontinent, and he was part of that. And when he got back to India, he was just so excited to be part of the independence movement until he was not, because it was so casteist. And his approach was he was so disheartened and disillusioned by that violence 
that he just went back to Punjab and he actually started a political religious movement called the Adhar movement, um, which was a challenge to Arya Samaj and other um, uh, movements that, was, that were not censuring caste oppressed peoples. And as a result, even today, um, p there are many, many Dalits in Punjab who not only acknowledge his lineage, but also identify as a Dharmi because of that role that it played. You know, and another really critical piece of diasporic history I think we absolutely need to claim is that the architect of the Indian Constitution, Dr. Ambedkar, did his studies and was one of the first South Asians to attend an Ivy League school in Columbia University. And the reason why that is so significant is because, you know, his experience being in the United States formed so many of ideas of what he wanted India to be because he saw in the United States another English colony, keep in mind he's coming in as a former colonial subject, um, that you, know, you can have aspirations towards liberty, but the rule of law will fail if it doesn't take into account minorities. And he saw the conditions of segregation for black people. He saw the limitations on women, um, because at that time, women, all women were not given the right to vote. And that's why he pushed so hard in the, in the Indian constitution for you know, separate protections for caste oppressed peoples and for women's rights through the Hindu code bill. And so his time in the diaspora was incredibly uh, important for his vision for um, the Indian nation. And, and I think we should always claim that as a diasporic lineage because he wouldn't have had that insight if he hadn't seen the failures of American democracy. Um, I also think another really critical piece of his diasporic experience was his exchange with W.E.B. Du Bois and the possibilities of how black internationalism and the ways that you know, uh, black liberation movements were using you know, things like the League of Nations, which was a forerunner for the UN, as well as um, the internationalist solidarities to find opportunity. This was also work that Dr. Ambedkar had be begun, and many other Dalits were starting to take into consideration when you think about folks like Ayodhya Das from Tamil Nadu, who created you know, one of the first diasporic movements for caste equity and actually had deep connections with um, migrants in Australia and Malaysia and, um, um, and, um, and South Africa. Um, and this is some of that correspondence. You can take a look at it there. I also think another really critical, potent diasporic connection is the, the connection between Black Panthers and the Dalit Panthers. And, you know, again, you know, the movements of oppressed people are all about material solidarities. And oftentimes there is a unique kind of technology and analysis about how to do an end run around dominator systems that we can learn from each other. And I think this was a critical moment where in the face of punishing you know, impunity um, related to caste violence in Maharashtra, you had a group of Dalit poets and leaders that were inspired by the resistance of the Black Panthers and created their own Dalit Panthers. And that really shifted so much of the possibilities of how people were thinking about intervening on the caste system because there was people that would be marching around the bodies of victims trying to protect those, um, protect those victims' bodies, um, particularly in caste murders, so that um, the police could come to investigate. So the ways that people could use different tactics, especially when there was legal impunity, that was a really beautiful kind of piece of cross-pollination. Um, and then I think when we move to you know, the 1990s and we get to the next wave of immigration that really is you know, transformative to the diaspora, we start to see um, the ways that we see caste and the labor force really connected. And you know, this one case in 2000 was actually probably one of the first big cases related to caste. And it had to do with this guy named Lucky Bali Reddy who um, you know, was in the city of Berkeley, um, and he was the second largest landlord in the city of Berkeley. And over the course of his career, he trafficked close to 200 to 300 workers. And a select group of those workers were young Dalit girls as young as 13 and 11. And the thing that was so interesting is he did this out in the open because he had so many buildings. So if you, and I lived at Berkeley at the time and I went to University of California, Berkeley, so I saw it. I was only a couple of years older than the girls uh, in question. And what was wild about this case was that 
the girls were everywhere. They were on his roofs, repairing his roofs. They were cleaning his buildings. They were serving food. And nobody paid attention because Dalit women and girls are not legible to people in power. And what was also very profound was that the system of abuse started in India. So he would go back to India, he would visit the schools, and he would be invited as a guest of honor. And when he would be felicitated and the young girls would go on stage, that's who he would select, who he'd want to sleep with. So he was grooming them in India and then trafficking them over here. And it was so intense because, again, you know, with caste, there is so much impunity. And, you know, Lucky Bali Reddy is a Reddy caste, which is a very powerful dominant caste in um, Andhra Pradesh. And, um, and it was very, very difficult. The thing that was so interesting was that, you know, even as the case was occurring, there were so many things about the lack of competency that made it hard to prosecute this case. So, for example, um, they had a difficulty finding interpreters because um, people were afraid of interpreting in a case against Lucky Bali Reddy because he was so powerful. So it was only because of powerful community activists and women's groups who really supported these survivors that eventually he got um, convicted. And he served three years in jail, which is not enough given the, some, the tremendous, you know, heinous nature of his crimes. But that was such a win given how much caste impunity exists. And because of you know, the shocking nature of this case, it led to some of the first trafficking laws in the state of California, just because of how egregious it was. And, you know, and I think this is what's an, a really important trend that you're gonna see is that you know, caste is a human rights issue, caste is a women's rights issue, and caste is a, um, a worker's rights issue. And the, ca the issues of caste-oppressed peoples are important to the larger American mainstream public because they are so severe and they affect so many workers. They transform the American legal landscape. Um, and here's another important case, which is um, you know, the, the EEOC, and there was also a private civil rights case in 2011 where Signal Corporation, which was like a shipping corporation that brought and trafficked workers from South Asia to help rebuild the Gulf after Hurricane Katrina. And what was very intense was that, you know, these Indian workers paid money to coyotes to bring them into Mississippi, and they lived in really inhuman conditions in like metal houses with very, very little money, plus their passports were held. And the conditions were found so, you know, so, um, so violent that there was a multi-million dollar settlement both with the government and also in the private um, thing, in the, in the private suit. And again, here's a situation where you didn't need to be an expert on caste to know that this was wrong. And um, it led to you know, um, changes at, uh, around trafficking at the federal level. And then, you know, and then, you know, of course, like in 2020, we saw that the California Department for Fairness and Employment and Housing sued Cisco Corporation for caste discrimination. And this was, you know, a very historical moment because it's the first time um, outside um, of India and in the United States that we're seeing an American corporation being sued for caste discrimination. And you know what's very important is again the DFEH is not an expert on caste, but they are an expert on civil rights. And the complaints that you know John Doe, who filed this case, um, said were very severe. He said there was attempts to find his caste identity. There was you know uh, definitely a casteist hostile workplace that led to his you know demotion and eventual termination. And they have already investigated. So they, it's not like there's like a question about it. They saw enough of harm to basically pursue this high level um, piece of litigation. And it's now currently going through the courts. And in the wake of that, you know, through our hotlines at Equality Labs, we had over 260 folks like reach out to us about complaints in other companies like Uber and Netflix and Apple and Google. So we know that this is a serious issue. And I think just last, you know, just this year, you know, it, it just feels like the cases keep coming up. And I think that's because caste oppressed people are feeling more, feeling more com you know, comfortable to come forward. And, you know, in New Jersey, we saw that there was a human trafficking case at a religious institution where workers were paid one, you know, 120 an hour 
$1.20 for years to build a, a religious institution. And, and I think the thing that is so striking about this case is, again, there was courage to come forward. And if this case goes forward, this will essentially lead to one of the largest trafficking cases in American labor history. So again, what's happening with South Asians when they go and travel, they're not just bringing caste like, you know, in a small interpersonal way, <laughs> they're actually bringing it in a huge structural way, which is why policy measures are really required. And, you know, I think what's so poignant, you know, as someone who does a lot of um, worker support with, um, you know, with our community who are facing caste discrimination in workplaces and universities, is that the question of competency really becomes a barrier as to why people don't report. So I, you know, I thought this was such a great statement that one of the workers shared with me is that why would I report to HR when they probably don't even know where India is on the map? You know, and that's that's a very true thing. Like, you know, under white supremacy, there isn't a lot of understanding of our context. And especially with caste and religious minorities, we are minorities within minorities. And I just don't think a lot of folks who are in these institutions are ready to understand that. But because um, we are in there, we, we basically have to fight for our civil rights for that acknowledgement. And, you know, and I wanted to share some examples of casteism in tech because this is the kinds of discourse that we're seeing inside of companies, you know. So in this slide, you see where people are making comments about their English and, you know, calling them ultra backward and, you know, diminishing their achievement and, you know, even referencing a Dalit politician to be jerks about it. Um, you also have here like this connection to like anti-blackness where, you know, first of all, there's this like fear like to, to get rid of caste would have anarchy. And then are you also a BLM supporter, which I thought was absurd, you know. Um, you also have in the second one this idea of like victim mentality. So you see the kind of dismissal and gaslighting that is very common in, the, in these situations. Um, and, you know, across the board, like from workplace issues, these are the things that we're hearing slurs, harassment, bias in hiring and promotion, disparate salaries, attempts to outcast identity in the workplace, biased appraisal and evaluations, unfair peer reviews, sexual harassment, demotion, and even retaliation. So again, these are serious issues. You do not have to be an expert in caste to know we have a serious problem. And I think that's why there is this very powerful movement. And this is an image that comes from um, the first congressional briefing about caste discrimination that took place in 2016. And this really, you know, helped to really explain this issue to um, Congress people. And we've had many congressional offices that have wanted to work on this issue since then, you know, including Representative Ro Khanna, who helped us, in, you know, introduce a resolution to celebrate Dr. Ambedkar and Dalit History Month. Because again, recognition and acknowledgement isn't just about harm, it's also about cele celebrating our history and lineages of resistance. But I think that, you know, what's important for us now is to really think about what can institutions do. And so I wanted to leave people with some takeaways. And the first thing is, add cast as a protected category. Once you do that, it opens up this whole piece related to implementing training and developing cast competencies. We can also then start to set like really strong KPIs to help measure progress, which can include the, some of the things that we talked about, um, but also uh, to center caste oppressed people and organizations in our movements. I also think for people who wanna be caste equity allies, there's a lot of personal work that I think needs to happen. And the first is to commit to a growth mindset um, that really allows people to feel comfortable being in discomfort and to approach, you know, approach courageous uh, conversations um, with, you know, thoughtfulness and with a mind for um, uh, mindfulness. Um, also for people to begin to map their context in terms of race, caste, and gender so they're clear about what their own lineages are. And that will help the development of precision in language and action so that people can be, again, have more intention in terms of their implicit and explicit biases. The other thing is, is that we need to be able to train ourselves to address microaggressions by upstanding and engaging in compassionate interventions so that we stop putting the burden of caste equity on the excluded. 
And that's so important because I think the reasons why we have the strong movement that we have today is because caste oppressed people have braved punishing violence and exclusion to come forward. But in order to truly annihilate caste, we need all of us. And that burden needs to be shared by many hands, you know. And so, you know, it's my hope that, you know, we will be able to, um, uh, you know, have a richer conversation um, about these issues because, again, I think that these, these, the, the idea of talking about caste is so taboo and so painful for many because I, I, I really do believe there is a wound that comes with caste supremacy that we are not able to speak authentically about because of um, uh, the punishing way Brahmanism uh, really deals with those who would try to challenge it. But I think that just because we're not talking about it doesn't mean that we're not reliving this wound over and over and over again. And the first stop, you know, the first part of healing is to just acknowledge that there's pain. And once we acknowledge that there's pain, we can then begin to get the solve of connection. And one thing I always say to people who have caste privilege is that, you know, to consider, you know, losing some of that, you know, privilege might be very frightening. But I think what you lose in perceived privilege, you actually gain in humanity because we are healing the divide between us as people. So I'm just looking forward to um, you know, going into the conversation and I pass it back to Nisha so we can get into dialogue. Thank you so much, Tenmori. That was a very powerful um, history of casteism in the North American diaspora. Um, and I think through telling that story, you've mapped for us um, where all the work needs to occur um, for anyone, right, in the diaspora. Thank you for sort of continuously drawing parallels to Australia, where certainly we have, you know, we have a we have a settler dynamic, we have a white Australia dynamic. Um, so I think uh, many of our community members listening will be making those connections. Um, but you're also reminding us of the work that needs to be done within South Asian and Indian communities. Um, and then you've also reminded us that there's work to be done at the individual and the interpersonal level. So I'm sure um, we're going to have some really interesting uh, questions coming in. Uh, but just to get us started, uh, Mudit and I will ask you a question each, and then we'll take questions in twos and threes and keep going. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, the question I have for you, it has to do with uh, your work um, uh, as an educator. I know that, you know, you're not just a media activist, you're not just a, uh, you don't just do advocacy in the highest corridors of power in the US. Uh, you're not just a researcher. I think at heart, you are an educator. Um, and so I'd like you to talk a little bit about how you approach um, what you call de um knowledge um, through your education work. Um, you know, you've shared many times that you're influenced by Dalit Bahujan feminists. Um, so if you could speak a little bit to, um, you know, how you approach your education work and specifically um, those amazing workshops that Equality Labs have now started to offer. And I was delighted to see recently that they've even gone online. So perhaps we can even bring you to our part of the world fingers crossed um, very soon, you know, to, to do an online workshop for us. So uh, would you please speak to that a little bit? Mudit, could you ask your question as well? And then, then Mori can answer as she likes. Thanks. Yeah, uh, my question is around the idea of awareness and why it's not enough and why oppressors especially need to understand that the dehumanization that they keep looking for as an something as something external or like they keep turning the lens on people from protected caste categories they need to turn the lens on themselves so yeah like the dehumanization is in their mind so yeah if you could address that why and how people especially obfuscate that sure so i i'll, I'll kind of combine both of those questions because i think that they're interrelated so you know, one of the things that I have seen, you know, in having worked on multiple um, uh, battles for caste equity 
is that oftentimes when you are seeing caste privileged people talk about the issue of caste, you know, while there, I'm sure there are definitely some craven people at the top that are power mongers and they know what they're doing, um, there are many people who actually, who believe that they will be harmed if caste oppressed peoples receive their rights. And when you watch their body language, when you watch their cognitive functions, you realize that their nervous systems are highly dysregulated when it comes to caste, and that they are no longer able to even deal with like an evidence-based conversation because they've just gone down a whole path of chaos um, that really comes from someone kind of pushing them on the fact that their caste reality may not be the only one. And I think that that dominant caste fragility has been a huge barrier um, because we have let the pace of caste equity be determined by the discomfort of caste privileged people versus what is needed in terms of the right of law and the rights of caste oppressed people. So I think in our approach related to trainings around unlearning caste supremacy, we take a Dalit feminist approach, which is intersectional and multimodal in nature, when we're, we're basically looking at the fact that in order to really understand Brahmanism, you need to both know the history, you need to also build self-awareness of where your nervous system is operating in terms of you know, the facts and evidence that are being presented, and you need to be retrained to operate in an intercaste space. Because even you know, many intercaste spaces where people haven't done that inner work, you'll find dominant caste people still dominating because that's what people know how to do. So we have to really work to retrain our bodies, our minds and spirits to, to be in de-Brahmanized ways with each other. It is as ambitious a project as decolonizing, and I would argue that in the South Asian context, to decolonize, we first must de-Brahmanize. And so it's um, our workshop process, which we started shortly after our survey, has been incredibly successful, where we've had you know thousands of people take this workshop, join the movement after taking these trainings and are working actively to continue to unlearn caste supremacy, which is a lifetime process. You know, if it took, you know, 20 to 30 years for you to become a dominant caste person, it's going to take you 10 to 15 years to really be able to regain um, your practices um, of caste equity. And, and I think what's tremendous about that process is that um, it's such a loving community because people recognize how much and you know caste has ravaged all of us you know we have been so separated and divided from each other and by what for what reason so that a few can profit at the expense of the many and I think that when we see how many institutions have been ravaged by Brahmanism and also the critical juncture that we're in in terms of history and the fate of our region and um, the millions of lives that hang in the balance, people want another way. So where I think before people were much more fixed around the choices, I think more and more people are willing to shed their privilege, but they need to do so in a way where they're accountable and learning from caste oppressed peoples, otherwise you can recreate and um, continue caste harm. And I think, Mudi, to your question, this is where I think the work that has really influenced us a lot in terms of Equality Labs, we've been influenced by black embodied practitioners like Resma Menachem, uh, who wrote this book, Remembering My Grandmother's Hands, Ruth King, who has worked on the mindfulness of race, and Rhonda McGee, who also is a very powerful practitioner around race and um, mindfulness, is that the idea that we need to be embodied in our transformation around de-Brahmanizing is a very, very critical thing that we are trying to shift and we're seeing um, very powerful interventions as a result. Yeah, I understand that the process is an active one. It is not necessarily a passive one, which a lot of people believe it to be. Well, I think people think they can read a book and then all of a sudden change cast when actually a lot of people who read books are still deeply casteist. A lot of people who write books who are dominant caste professors still do casteist things, you know? And why is that happening? Because people are not conscious. They're not 
really slowing down enough to look at what is my impact on uh, caste and religious minorities. And, and that's not to say that they aren't being good intentioned. I think it's just that it takes a lot to really retrain at the nervous system somatic level your behaviors in terms of dominance and interconnectedness. And so that's where attention is needed, focus, is, uh, and that focus will really pay off in shifts of dynamics of movements and, and so on. Thanks, Tenmuri. We have um, two questions from Professor Vikrant Kishore, which I will ask on his behalf. And then we have someone uh, wanting to speak to you directly. Um, so the questions from Vikrant are, why is it important to tell the stories of lived experience of Dalits, especially in the diaspora? Um, and relatedly, talking of Dalit identity or coming out is still very problematic, challenging, and traumatic. How can we build support across the globe? Um, so those are two questions from Vikrant. Neeraj, uh, you are now on camera. Can I request you to turn your mic on and ask your question, please? Thank you. Hi, uh, can you listen to me? Yep, all good. <clears throat> Hi, uh, good morning from this side. And uh, in fact, many of just a few years back, I came to know that my nanny was a Dalit, you know, and uh, that excited me a lot because he loved me so much you know, in childhood. So that was my background uh, on this issue. And uh, <clears throat> there is a question going on in India at the moment about caste census. So I wanted to know your opinion about that because the Indian government not ready for that. Uh, so have you ever thought about it? Uh, what could be the reasons and why do we need a caste census in India? was census we have with the British started uh, so long back, but but there is no mention of past. And long back, there was once something that happened and we have all the old statistics. So about caste uh, census in India. And secondly, in the Australian census, there's no mention of past. There are every community is mentioned. Everything is mentioned except in caste. In the end, there was a column if I had a proposal, so I propose there that people, there should, could be a caste angle also. So at least we need, we come to know how many people need help or how we can do some positive things. So I need your view on that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we did do a lot of, we did create a lot of noise around how we need to include protected categories, caste categories, uh, especially if you identify as Indian. In the census, in the Australian census, those categories should pop up and you should be able to identify it with those as well. Obviously, when the data shows up, you would be it, it would be de-identified, your name wouldn't be there. But yeah, we did make a lot of noise around this time. About the Indian census, uh, what do you think, you know? Sure, um, I can answer that. I also saw Nisha, did Vikrant need to ask something too? Because I saw some notes in the comments or should I just respond? Now? Yeah, um, I think if you could respond and then Vikrant will jump in. So I think I am a big believer in data and the Indian government doesn't want data around this because as soon as the data comes out, it's not going to look good and then there's going to be an uproar. So that's why it doesn't want to do data. There's actually, there's actually data from the previous census that still hasn't even been released yet. So, you know, the, the, there's a lot of helpful information we would get, which is not only um, the data of how many casts there are and the percentage of population, where you can also cross check that data across like many different other indicators, whether that's like health or, you know, discrimination in terms of housing and income, and then make the understanding of how is caste contributing to structural exclusion. When you don't have that data, you can't, which is why um, this is a conversation right now. Um, so um, I believe I've answered that question. Um, and then I think for Krant, you know, the thing about how to make uh, a caste equitable um, environment so that people feel safe, I think that's all about the culture of an institution or an organization or a movement. So adding caste as a protected category is huge because when a group, when that happens, it's a signifier to caste oppressed people that people are intentionally thinking about this issue 
and then there's a place if there's harm that they can bring remedy. But I also think like having um, you know certain markers that that really showcase that you are an equitable place. Like that's a big reason why I have Doctor Embedkar is that you know any Dalit around the world, if they see an image of Doctor Embedkar, they know that it's a safe harbor for them to be able to be out. Um, I also think like thinking conscientiously about practices um, that are cast equitable in terms of food and dining. So. I remember having conversations and, you know, thankfully because of the work of EL, like we've seen a huge change in South Asian organizations, but in the beginning, you know, people would say, we're, we're gonna have only vegetarian food for catering for this event. And I would say, well, if you do that, that's gonna exclude, you know, South Asian caste and religious minorities. Um, they will assume that this is not a safe space. And they're like, well, it's cheaper this way. And I was like, is that expense worth not having cast oppressed people there. You know, just have like a veggie section, a non-veg section and make the non-veg halal and then you hit all the markers and you're good to go. And because of that advocacy we've made, we've seen a transformation in South Asian orgs who are now, you know, ospe you know changing those um, processes. Um, I also think hiring, you know, cast oppressed people or having cast oppressed people in visible uh, positions of power also makes a huge difference because when people see uh, leaders who are identifying as Dalit and caste oppressed, it makes them feel more competent to come out. Like, and, that, and again, as someone who has been working on this issue for many years, I remember when I used to be the only person that identified as Dalit, and now because of our work, we've seen so many people across the spectrum be proud to name themselves as caste oppressed and Dalit and embed cry. And that's a result of visibility, you know. Thanks, then, Marie Vikrant. Would you like to respond or have a follow-up question, please? Yeah, thanks, Nasha. Thanks, Mudit. And uh, <clears throat> good to see you, Tenmoy. And uh, yeah, I've been following your work, and uh, it's very commendable work that you have been doing. And uh, I think uh, you have gone through the challenges uh, being in the diaspora and working on Dalit issues. And that is the challenge we are facing here now in Australia. Firstly, and then I, I feel that the challenge is also internal challenge for Dalits who take time to come out and discuss or talk about or share their own stories. And I really want that thing to be come out and uh, accept those stories from the Dalit side because lots of times our keeping silent becomes a weapon for others as well to more dehumanize as well as not acknowledge. So one of the problems that I see with which South Asians across the world do is that they want the minority status. They want to be politically correct. So I see the South Asians here, you know, wanting to talk politically correct when it comes to indigenous rights or when it comes to people of color, you know, and their representation but not never acknowledging the caste discrimination or the discrimination of the indigenous, Indian indigenous, the tribals. So those are the kind of problems. And uh, while in US, thankfully, you know, with Equity Labs and others who have worked really hard, I always want to, you know, uh, one, one of the question is that how do we build that solidarity? How do we play across the kind of strengths or the kind of uh, steps that has been taken uh, positively in US, UK, and how do we, in a way, I'm not saying replicate, but at least be motivated and enthused by the kind of work that has been done and uh, start that discussion here. Well, um, thank you so much, Vikrant, for asking that question. And I think that, you know, I'll answer it in two, two different uh, phases. So, you know, I think that um, one of the things you have to kind of consider is that this work is incremental over time. You know, so, and I think that as a Dalit organizer, you know, we're playing the long game, you know, and I remember when I first started, people just thought I was totally bad shit. You know, they just thought I was, you know, not uh, that, you know, I remember this one person saying nothing's going to change. So I don't even know why you're trying, you know, and it was absurd, like the amount of disbelief that people thought that a strategy like this could work. And I just took, wouldn't take no for an answer, you know? And I think that is the power of Dalit women is that people will give us no all the time. So we're not kind of intimidated by a no. But, um, but I, I'm saying that mostly because um, when you're first starting to build movements for caste equity, 
the hardest thing is to really break that divide that exists between where caste oppressed people are gathering and where caste privileged people gather. Because many caste, you know, caste oppressed people are always in their spaces, whether it's their Ravadasya temples or their Buddhist sanghas or, you know, their cultural groups, they're doing their thing and they want nothing to do for the most part with dominant caste spaces because they're so afraid and they're also like, we're just gonna get treated like crap anyway, so we're not gonna go there. So one of the pieces I think to kind of heal that divide is to have more and more programming that focuses on Ambedkarite work and to collaborate with Ambedkarite and Ravadasya groups, wherever they might be. Because when people have shared re relationships and leadership, that starts to open up new possibilities. The other thing is, and I think, you know, I, I kind of cite my own practice as a Dalit feminist, is that the ways we address the fear, uh, which was very palpable in our community around these issues as we were building power, is we created pipelines for anonymous reporting and storytelling. And that, I think, was a crucial um, win and a tactic I really want to recommend because, again, you'll have 20 million people tell you that bad things are happening and you'll say, well, would you be willing to speak to this reporter or would you be willing to speak to um, this, this parliamentarian? And people would say, absolutely not. If it comes out that I'm the one that did this, I could lose my job, I could lose my visa, I am terrified, I don't want that to happen, no way. But in terms of our work as a civil rights organization, we are very much a trusted institution and we've spent time really building relationships with other stakeholders in the field, whether it's Congress people's offices or domestic violence shelters or um, human rights councils so that you know we can basically take those stories and then find innovative ways to share them. So, you know, we did like a series where we did like radio clips and took people's stories and then recorded them with another person so that they were embodied, if not by them, uh, which was like one approach. Um, the other thing that we did was we also were able to create illustrations and use art to embody the stories so that, again, even if people told us their stories anonymously, we wanted people to see them in a way where we're materialized. And that anonymity pipeline was very, very effective because what it did was snowball because all of a sudden people are hearing these stories and they're like, yes, this is happening. I'm not alone. That encouraged more people to come forward. And then as more people came forward, then you started to see people giving actual testimonies, which was wonderful. But even then, they still might be giving it anonymously because again, what we're seeing is when some Dalit people you know, present, there are you know, caste privileged people that wanna dox them or prevent them or harass them at their work. So, being innovative around this challenge is possible, and we're seeing wins as a result of this. And so I just want to encourage you to, you know, it may have felt like going uphill because the process is slow in the beginning, but it starts to exponentially build the more people feel safe with each other and, are, 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 and feel the confidence of what visibility looks like, you know. And I think to do that, there needs to be... Um, uh, there needs to be creative tools that are used. I also think that data is a really critical way to also do that because in anonymous surveys, you can tell the story of the problem without people giving away their information. And I think that people were very candid with us in our survey um, because they trusted us as Dalit feminists, you know. And so, you know, if there's ever, a, a, you know, a capacity or interest in working on a cast in Australia survey, we would be happy to... Uh, collaborate because again I think for us um, that trust people have with the Dalit institution working on these issues has really been transformative in the diversity of the responses that are received. Great thanks yeah uh, uh, I take your point and it is important and this is what we I noticed in my university I recently proposed a research-based project a web series on the lived experience of Australian Indian diasporic women, Dalit women. And we are doing a kind of a 10 part web series, but we'll start with three first. And this was the first time in where, where my university staff members actually got to know about the issues of caste. And especially I find it problematic where my, my, my university, I'm not going to name it, which boasts of getting 5,000 Indian students every year to come and study in the university. 
and the university does not have any clue about the caste kind of uh, divide or the things, or they don't even have any kind of concessions or any kind of regard for the indigenous Indians or the Dalit Indians in terms of you know, their scholarships. So the scholarships again are being pocketed by you know, all the privileged class and privileged people. And we want to change that kind of, uh, kind of an understanding and perception. And, uh, uh, and uh, before I end my thing, I would definitely you know, thank Nisha and Mudit, especially Nisha for spearheading this thing. And she has really dedicated about three episodes of EOR on this. So, and this is a first of its kind thing and which really motivates me to keep working on this space. And thanks Tenmoi for today. Oh yeah, and and but and I think also like that transformation of us being able to talk about the battle for caste equity in the language of diversity and equity and inclusion, which is how these institutions operate, is another critical piece of our movement building that needs to occur. Because I think particularly when you're talking about student admissions from South Asia, you know, the way we talk about caste and affirmative action or reservations as we talk about it there is not a discourse that is legible to an university administrators. Um, and I think that even the ways that they understand how they're thinking about diversity doesn't make accommodations for minorities within minorities. So it's there's so much kind of legibility and uh, data building that's required and scholars are in a unique place to be able to do that because they trust your expertise. In fact, they're funding you to be experts on these issues, right? So I, I feel like the ability to create some like very targeted reports with data and stories really then starts to shift the dynamic about what the ask can be. And I feel like, you know, we need systems thinkings about the ways we talk about the ask because I think that oftentimes um, people get very granular when trying to address remedies of um, caste discrimination. And I think we need to always pull back the camera so that we're saying, are we identifying the problem upstream enough? You know, because take, for example, a company like Google, you know, when they're looking at trying to diversify their workplaces, they have a model where they're thinking about from cradle to career. <laughs> Can you imagine <laughs> investments in all the aspects of human development to get people to a diverse workplace? Why shouldn't we as caste depressed people be equally um, uh, uh, ambitious? You know, when we're thinking about why aren't we seeing more caste depressed people apply for those scholarships, we can think of all of the systemic exclusionary hurdles that someone has to get to before applying. And you know, the university is not gonna be able to solve all of them, but there might be different institutions at the diasporic level that could assist with some of those hurdles at each step of the way. So in a systems level thinking, we wanna think about interlocking collaborative solutions that can also work in that way as well. Thank you, Tenmuri, and thank you, Vikrant, for that exchange. Um, Tenmuri, are you happy to go for another five minutes? We have, okay, so we have a question from an audience member who wants to remain anonymous. Um, what would be good resources to connect to in order to support Dalit and mi minority rights in Australia? I am largely depending on social media for my education right now, uh, but how to bring about more policy-based change? <clears throat> and, an, and a question I have for you, um, which I've asked all of our speakers in this webinar series is how do you respond to the criticism that um, the work that you're doing is Hindu phobic? So, okay, so I will take the first one. So again, I think one of the ways to think about policy development is to talk with people that develop policy. So in some ways, like I would really recommend, you know, doing a closed door listening session with lawyers who are experts on civil rights in Australia to identify the inter areas of intervention that could be appropriate and that could help sh shape some of the campaign um, areas that you might want to focus. And we're happy to put you in touch with global experts related to caste equity that can be part of that session that could also bring in experience from other contexts if that's helpful for you. Um, so that's one. And then I think, you know, in terms of resources related to CAST, there are several bibliographies. I recommend social media learning uh, for CAST is like a good first start, 
but, um, but there's actually deep texts that you need to work with. And I think reading the work of Gail Omvith, um, you know, of uh, Geolosius and, you know, um, uh, even debrahmanizing history are really crucial texts that can really start to get your thinking around these issues. Um, I also think that, you know, how do I respond to like critics um, who say that my work might be against a religion or Hindu phobic? And I would say, um, you know, that is kind of an absurd statement as I was born Hindu and Christian. I mean, um, and that's, that's actually a very common thing for many Dalits is that we come from secretic households that come from multiple faiths. And it really doesn't get more Hindu than the way that I was born. Like my dad was one of the founding members of you know the Malibu Temple, which is one of the biggest temples on the West Coast. And he was one of the founding donors. And I had my ears pierced at, um, you know, uh, Mahaliburam, which is a big temple in Tamil Nadu, and, you know, grew up, you know, doing all those things and also being Christian. And, you know, I think one of the things my parents really tried to imbue me with was choice. Because the thing that is so profound about the violence of caste is that we are removed from consent in all of our engagements with the divine. And I just thought deeply about my, what I wanted from a spiritual practice, and I chose to walk away from both of the traditions that I was raised in um, and become Buddhist, you know? And, you know, not even like Buddhist in the traditional way, like I have a very personal practice that's my own, but frankly, it's not anyone's business, like what my religion is. And the fact that religion becomes centered in the conversation about caste equity says really more to the fact that Dalits face a system of exclusion that is rooted in religious practice. And so it brings up a whole bunch of discomfort related to the fragility of dominant caste people and the concerns they have of their faiths being implicated um, in caste oppression. And that's okay. You know, it's okay to feel fragile. It's not okay to use that to shut down my discourse around caste oppression because the burden of caste oppressed people has been that we have to tiptoe around the fragility of other people around the terrain of um, the violence against us. And I think we need to stop conflating the discourse over whether religions um, can be reformed with my primary project, which is the project to get free. And it is not the burden of caste oppressed peoples to reform uh, religions. It is our journey towards liberation to annihilate caste. And that's a very important distinction that I would say. And again, you know, I wish anyone that is in a process of reformation with whatever religious tradition they may be in, you know, blessings and healing and all of that, that is a very powerful process that needs to happen. It's often done solely by caste oppressed peoples, which has been a terrible, naughty thing to do. And, you know, but again, that is separate from what I'm engaging in right now, which is the question of caste equity. And, um, and I think that, you know, oftentimes questions like that aren't usually good faith questions or attempts to derail the conversation into um, a path that we're not about to go in because we're here to get free and we're here to annihilate caste. And, and that's really, you know, as a caste abolitionist and as someone who's committed to Dalit feminism, you know, it's so important that we always apply systems thinking in the ways that we are encountering attempts to derail conversations towards caste equity. Because again, this is the mindlessness of caste trauma playing out over and over and over again. And we need to slow down, slow down our nervous systems, slow down our thinking processes to be really intentional and conscious about what we're doing in terms of our roles around um, this very violent system. And when we start to do that, one of the things that we inherit is each other and the reclamation of our humanity. And fundamentally, that is the promise of caste abolition, is that we have the ability to find each other beyond these very polarizing divides of caste and religion and nationality and geography. And it's a wish that I hope that I can share with everyone here and all who would listen um, to this talk. 
Thank you for those beautiful words. Um, the promise of caste abolition is to be free and to find each other. Um, you've given us so much to think about. Then Marie, uh, again, I'm so honored and privileged to have had you with us for this brief time. Uh, we do hope that this is the beginning of something again across the ocean that divides us. Thank you for so generously offering throughout the last half an hour to be there for us, for those of us who are engaged in the struggle here. Um, so we very much look forward to keeping in touch with you um, now that we, uh, we've we connected with you. Um, Mudit and Tenmuri, if you have any closing thoughts, I'll hand over to you. But I'll just say thank you again, Tenmuri and Jay Bhim and Jay Saraswati. I do have one closing thought. Uh, yeah, so uh, Hindu phobia, which is what Tenmuri just addressed. I want to address the idea of umbrella terms in itself from an oppressor point of view. Uh, for example, when someone comes becomes transnationally mobile and comes to a place like Australia or the US as an Indian from an oppressor caste, there is a tendency to self-identify with labels that come from intersectional frameworks in the US. And yeah, I just want to caution people that it is a very offensive to do it because those frameworks are derived from generations of violence, converting conversion of humans into property, uh, dispossession of people, abduction of people from indigenous lands to um, operationalizing their labor as a resource on lands that they do not identify it are not familiar with. That is where frameworks like people of color, women of color, a lot of these frameworks come from. So yeah, be cautious when you operationalize or self-identify with these ideas of racing oneself because especially your structural geno the structural xenophobia or like uh, spontaneous xenophobia that you might be facing is still in a subordinate is in subordination of a white heteropatriarchal structure which is actively still dispossessing indigenous people in Australia or in the US. So you're still in that structure. And also you're adding, when you're becoming transnationally mobile, you're adding to your privilege that you already carry with you from back in India, which is which comes from dispossession of Dalit people, uh, backward classes people, indigenous people back in India. So it is still a pursuit of privilege. So when you do this self-identification, with whatever label, which includes labels of certain religions and like clarifications, like my religion is tolerant. Because when you apply these umbrella terms, you are taking away the idea of consent. There is no consent in applying a POC sort of a label to yourself if you're not taking permission, consent from people who derive these labels in their context. There is no consent in the idea when you ask someone to agree to you that you are tolerant when that is not their lived experience. So yeah, just always, always keep this in mind as an oppressor because you don't realize that your offensiveness or like your oppression is often passive or like confusing oftentimes. Just keep that in mind. Yeah, Tanmari, do you want to add something to that? Um, no, I, I think that, you know, again, I really want to thank everybody for coming and to also just know that the journey of unlearning is an important one. Um, it's not always easy, but it's so rewarding because again, what you lose in pri privilege, you gain in humanity. And that's where, you know, we have to really mourn what we've lost to caste, but that it's not far away for us to begin the reclamation of our humanity. So I just really want to leave people with that word, those words, because I know it can be, a very hopeless time, but take this talk as a place of hope. Take your relationship and refuge with each other as another place of hope and know that we will win this battle in our lifetime. So thank you and Jay Beam and Jay Savitri. Thank you, stay well. Thanks everyone for joining us. Take care.